Hey there guys, and welcome to a character creation video uh, I'm doing for Rogue Trader. Now, part of the reason is, is that people were interested in my Only War character creation that I did very quickly. And also that I'm going to be GMing a, um, a Rogue Trader show on Metamancer's channel, which is going to be uh, twitch.tv forward slash Metamancer. Uh, I'll put a link in the description if you want to check it out. Um, it's going to be starting next year, mid-January. I'll, uh, I'll give you the details more precise when I know exactly what, what week we're first starting and everything. But I figured it'd be nice for them if they had something to look at as well, if they wanted to kind of see how the character creation works. I'm also probably going to do a separate video that will be talking about, uh, about ship creation, because the ship creation is really cool and... Uh, it's worth it's worth knowing um, because it can get a little bit complicated. So uh, what we're going to do is I've got a um, I've got a sheet ready to go, and I've done some rolls and stuff already. And we're going to go over the characteristics, and then we're going to go over actually creating a character. So uh, first things first, you can see here we have oh, bloody hell uh, we have the different uh, characteristics. Uh, these are like stats in. For example, in something like D&D, you have like uh, strength, dexterity, uh, constitution. In uh, Rogue Trader, and in most uh, 40k games at least, uh, you have weapon skill, ballistic skill, strength, toughness, agility, intelligence, perception, willpower, and fellowship. Now, you'll probably know most of these, but basically, weapon skill is melee fighting, uh, swords and whatnot. Uh, ballistic skill is shooting, accuracy with ranged weapons. Strength is how strong, toughness is how tough, it's kind of like constitution, uh, it's how many hits you can take, it, it's how much kind of damage you can mitigate partially, and you know, if you take drugs for example, uh, it's how well you deal with those drugs. Um, agility is reflexes, it's a lot like dexterity, intelligence is how intelligent, uh, knowledge and reason, that kind of thing. Uh, perception is visual um if you're for example trying to trying to see an ambush or something maybe uh you'll be asked to roll uh skills based on perception uh willpower is a mix of psychic abilities this uh this system's version of magic i guess um and also resistance to things like fear and uh and some more nasty stuff uh, and then fellowship is like charisma um if you want to command someone, if you want to charm them, uh, things like that tend to, tend to go on fellowship. And how you roll how you roll your characteristics up, they can kind of uh, kind of change a little bit uh, depending on, on your GM. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through the basic way and then the way I like to do it, especially for shows. Uh, so the way I like to do it. Um, the basic way you do it, you can see here, all characters have 25 in every single one of those characteristics, and then you roll 2d10. And uh, I think the standard way is you roll uh, you roll uh, 2d10, add, add uh, the result to 25, and then you just put them where you want them. Um, and there, there are a few other ways, like it does mention here that you can have a pool of 100 uh, points in characteristics that you can add no higher than 20 uh, so that can get you a more kind of like specialized character if you're if you're making a character uh, in a specific role and you know exactly what characteristics you want I I guess that could um, that that could you know help you make the character exactly the way you want I personally prefer a bit of randomization but I also don't like it when people lose too much so um, we'll take I'll take you the way through the way I like to do it, and you can see I've rolled here um, because I'm bad at maths. I've actually uh, got the got the rolls already here. But what I like to do is I like to roll three d ten, and then and then take the two highest rolls. As you can see, I've rolled like a seven here, a two and a four and a one, which means that that stat is going to be six, whatever it is. Um, so yeah, that that's uh, that it shows you that you can still roll badly, and I, I did roll badly on, on a few of them. But it means that a lot. It means your character's a bit more rounded out. 
you're not going to have loads of terrible rolls, which is just a bit more possible with, with 2D10. And especially in a show, uh, like when we're going to be doing uh, the Rogue Trader game on Metamancer channel, it kinda, it, it's kind of dumb to have like a broken character who can't do any of their stuff. So I, I find I find I prefer to have it so that you you have the you have the ability to kind of skill your character how you want basically um, to get them to get them being able to do like if you make so if you make a sniper and you get you know three or four skill in ballistics you're going to be missing everything and you're going to be a useless sniper now it doesn't really exactly exactly work like that but that's just an example. Um, so what we're going to do is, usually I like to have a little bit of randomization. So the way I have my players roll is, um, instead of doing what I've done here, where you, I've rolled out all of the stats and I've added them all up, I can, I can see them here, and I can put them where I want. Um, usually what I do is I get them to roll a dice and then allocate it, and then roll another dice and allocate it. Now I quite like this way to do it because what you end up with is you end up with uh you know if you roll quite well like you know so let's say you get a let's say you get a 15 on on, on the 3d10 um off getting rid of the lowest result uh you can then be like well i may not roll better than that so i should put it in my safe in my safe statist you know stat like say you want to be a sniper again you put it in ballistic skill and then you got 30 uh if it's 15 yeah 15 uh you've got 40 in your ballistic skill which means that's going to be one of your higher skills if you then roll a 20 you know you roll two tens and like a five and you get rid of the five uh you can suddenly end up with like a random skill uh you know that you'd never consider having like intelligence on on like a melee brawler you end up having intelligence of like really high and you can end up having a really useful character in a bizarre way I think that leads to interesting roleplay and it helps with building your character in the kind of roleplay sense. So we're not going to do that this time. We're going to build a rogue trader who's going to be based around uh, probably probably like fellowship, uh, be a charismatic captain uh, with probably some intelligence and maybe ballistic weapon skill. Have him like pistol, chainsaw type type thing. So. Um, what we rolled, we rolled 15, 6, 8, 16, 13, 12, 11, 9, and 8. Let's get rid of the lowest ones first. So what don't we want high? Let's let's lose the perception. So that'll be 31. That's the 6. And we'll mark that off as gone. And then we've got two eights and a 9. So that'll be 33 and 34. Yes, 33 and 34. Okay, so 33, let's put that on. It's, uh, if we're going to go melee, though, put that on his agility. 33, and then another 33 can go on his intelligence, and then and 34 can go on his willpower, and that will get rid of these. So I make him, him fairly combat-y, which isn't necessarily where you want to take your rogue trader, but beautiful but that's what i'm doing uh someone just you know blazing past and uh outside my house M middle of the city i live in basically and they're just like vroom, about 60 miles an hour um so the next one will be 36 and i think we'll put that in toughness 36 there we go uh and then we've got 12 13 15 and 16 so 37 will go into i think our weapon skill uh actually no strength yeah 37 will go into strength and then 38 will go into weapon skill weapon sk there's no point of being strong if we don't actually hit them so your damage uh does take into account your strength with melee weapons so you know it, it's worth having weapon skill and melee skill and, and strength skill fairly high uh, ballistic skill is shooting. We'll put the 15 in there, so that's going to take us to 40. Uh, and then our fellowship is six. Uh, is we got 16 for our last one, so that'll be 41 on our fellowship. And there you go. That is the beginning 
of a character. Now we've got all these things. And for those of you who don't know the roles, uh, let's say I'm taking a shot. This isn't precisely how you do it, but it's using the same skill. So say we're taking a shot, we roll. I, you can see here in the big brackets, it says 32. I rolled a 32, which means it's just underneath ballistic skill with 0 0.8 degrees of success. I would then go on to roll damage, uh, and then you know you'd subtract it from the armor, see how many wounds you do, uh, depending on the damage of the gun and the penetration, etc., etc. Well, you know th this this is all stuff that's kind of like extra, not going to be included, but uh, that you get the general idea. Um, and yeah, so the next part we're going off to, uh, and there'll probably be a cut for this, is the origin path. Uh, the origin path is a really interesting. Uh, the origin path is a really interesting uh, way to create a character, which kind of it it mitigates the badness of your uh, of your roles a little bit, or it can increase the power of your character depending on how you want to play it. Like if you rolled fairly badly and you didn't get the ballistic skills you need, uh, we'll go to that in a second. So you, uh, let's say you you wanted a guy with strength. You can see this Death World character has plus five strength, plus five toughness, minus five willpower, minus five fellowship. And those those get modified on here. So if I was to pick that for my rogue trader, my my toughness and strength would go up, which means I'd have more, uh, I'd be stronger, I'd, I'd be more resistant to damage. But my fellowship and, and I think it's intelligence go down, which means I'd have less. So yeah, it, it's, it's a trade off and, uh, and uh, if we just, do this rotate there we go um this is this is how you run the origin path so the way you run the origin path is you pick what you want for the first one so hive world forge world voidborn we'll get into exactly what those mean in a second um but you then go down and you can you go down like this like uh, vertically and you can pick anything on either side or below. So, for example, if we're going Hive World, let's just uh, zoom in here a little bit. Oh god, there we go. You, I wanted to be in, make sure you'd be able to read. Uh, if we pick Hive World, this one here, uh, you can then go in your birthright to Stubjack, Child of the Creed, Savant. So let's say we went Hive World, Stubjack, when we go to Lure of the Void, which is the next part of the path, we can go Criminal, Renegade, or Duty Bound. So I can't go like Imperial World here, and then go to Scavenger, because then they're not next to each other. So that's how you do the, I'm gonna have to, <laughs> I'm gonna have to mess with this a little bit now. Uh, so rotate clockwise. I just wanted you guys to be able to see that properly. And that's upside down, rotate clockwise. I think it was like that yes yes it was okay great so i know the origin paths reasonably well i may need to go back to refer to it but because we're making a i'm not going to go through all of this because this video would be about 10 hours long you can see for example like the hive world characters have minus five toughness plus five fellowship they get skills in certain thing they get a, a kind of talent thing where they're used to crowds they get a, they get bonuses to walking through crowds of people when running and charging you know like they get uh you get your starting wounds uh, which is like your hit points you get starting fate points which you can use to re-roll and to not die uh so what we're gonna do is we'll make a we'll make a nobleborn rogue trader so nobleborn uh, i believe they're at the the very end let's just go back and double check on this yep nobleborn are on the very end so uh, we'll make a noble-born character, and we'll adjust our stats and give the skills and all this kind of thing. Uh, they're, it's fairly obvious they 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 were born on a fairly nice world to to very rich family and, and all that kind of thing. And as we as you go through this, you'll actually um, you'll actually see how you can work your way through creating a even if you've got no idea of what type of character you want to make you can actually start to build the kind of like the the structure of your character as you as you build uh, as you go through this uh through this path so 
noble-born characters, you know, born into wealth and privilege, educated by tutors, you know, maybe they're kind of posh and uh, and a bit a bit sheltered from from life before they became a rogue trader. You know, there's there's additional steps to uh, to this. So first things first, minus five willpower, plus five fellowship, which means minus five willpower. We're down to twenty nine willpower. Plus five, it means we're forty six. Uh, the dice system is a D100, so I'm almost 50-50 success failure on my fellowship. With skills and stuff like that, that means that this character so far is very, very charismatic. And he's going to be good at things like, you can see the, the things here, but um, fellowship is like barter, charm, command, deceive, disguise, inquiry. Like th These are all skills that you'll use on, the, on a regular basis. Uh, depending on your GM a little bit as well. So the starting skills we get, uh, we get literacy, speak language. Okay, so speak language, low gothic, yes. Uh, there we go. Literacy. And so when you add your skills, uh, you can add literacy and then intelligence, and then you can tick it. And you can see here where it says roll, that is the... Uh, that is the kind of the thing you're aiming for so it's based on intelligence we have 33 intelligence we have to roll under 33 on a d100 so you see i rolled an 84 i failed with minus 5.1 degrees of success that means if i was trying to read a book in a slightly weird language or i was trying to like you know i was trying to do something in in terms of like reading and book book lore and that kind of stuff i would have failed horribly now, if you tick further to 10 or 20, you actually uh, get more skill. So you don't have to increase your characteristics, like your intelligence. You can actually increase your skills in it, and it gives you a bonus. So now, I need to roll below 53 instead of 33. I still failed because I'm rolling terribly, but that's not really the point. Um, okay, so literacy, and then we what else do we get? Speak language, high gothic, speak language, low gothic as untrained basic skills oh so these are untrained basic skills okay so untrained basic skills uh means that these are at a they're at a half uh, thing so we have to aim for 16 or under on a d100 which is oops. okay so uh speak language go beautiful um what else do we have to do for this guy uh etiquette nobles are schooled in how to comport themselves in all manner of formal situations they gain a plus 10 bonus on interaction skills when dealing with so this is something you can add in um i wonder if they have any kind of bits of this uh where you where you can kind of add this stuff in so you got your experience so this will probably go down here so plus ten uh, in interaction with nobles. Did it say nobles? It said something along those lines. Uh, high authority and formal. Okay, so you, you put like with 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 uh, high authority and formal situations. So that just means that if you're if you're trying to charm someone at a party. You know, if you're trying to charm an Inquisitor, something like that, you get plus 10, and you can go down to that, and you'd be like, oh, wait, I get plus 10 to this, and the GM will be like, yeah, okay, go. Da damn you for uh, sidestepping my Inquisitor storyline. Uh, legacy of wealth. To be born an Imperial Noble is to inherit a legacy of staggering wealth, uh, even a scorn sign. Yeah, so you add plus 1 to your starting profit factor. Because, uh, let's see, where's profit factor? There we go. Starting profit factor is one so far. We'll put it on one there. Uh, so because Rogue Trader deals with such a such an immense scope in terms of equipment and money and all this kind of thing, instead of having uh, instead of having like money and gear precisely, you have profit factor, 
Um, and if you want to acquire something, very often you, you'll roll against your profit factor on a D100. So if you have 50 profit factor, you have to get under 50 to acquire something. And it, it's, uh, it's modified by like rarity and stuff like that. So if you're trying to find something really rare and you have a profit factor of 50, which is really good, incidentally, uh, you roll in your profit factor and it'll be minus 40 or something like that. So you'll have to roll 10 or under. To, to, to be able to manage to get it. So it, it can still be very difficult to get some certain things. Uh, supremely connected, uh, peer nobility talent. Okay. So you take the talent. Oh, God damn, where is everything here? Uh, wounds, experience points, uh, gear, acquisition, melee range, special abilities. Is that special? Oh, there it is. Okay. So uh, talents and traits. Uh, that's weapon trainings. So you have uh, here nobility. I think I did that. S yeah, those, those brackets are wrong, but that's fine. Uh, done. Okay, so yeah, you've got peer nobility now, which basically means I believe that you um, have a plus 10 to interacting with those people as well. Uh, also to reflect family power base gains one additional peer from the following list so you can actually pick which one so uh academics adeptus mechanicus administratum astropaths ecclesiarchy government uh, mercantile military or underworld so you can have a you can have a peer for that which it, which gives you bonus to interacting with those groups now let's go with government uh, for this guy because i feel like he's a little bit of a He's, he's a little bit connected. Uh, so, government. So, if you're dealing with uh, with governors and uh, administration, like that, like those type of people, uh, he's going to get a bonus to dealing with them. If like the Inquisition comes around, he doesn't actually have anything to to kind of deal with the Inquisition. So, that's going to be more difficult. Except for he's got that. Uh, oh god, there we go. Uh, so every noble house has sworn enemies, uh, even those... Uh, the details of the... So basically, Vendetta pretty much means that your character is going to have enemies. Powerful groups working against you, maybe another rogue trader, individual... It, it, it's basically... Picking, picking this one is very good for a rogue trader. It also means that he might be a little bit... Or he or she might be a little bit screwed in the future because it gives the gm like free reign to be like yes your enemies are working against you and uh, enjoy that so we don't really need to put that down not not for this but yeah it, it'd be worth making a note of uh, if you were playing this character so starting wounds noble born characters double their starting toughness bonus and add 1d5 okay so let's talk about this so i find that people people can be very uh People can be very paranoid about dying in these types of games. And it's always nice to have a lot of hit points. To have a lot of wounds, basically. So the way I like to do hit points, the way I like to do wounds, uh, in this, it's... Uh, in this, it's double your toughness bonus, uh, plus a d5. So the toughness, the bonus, whenever it talks about bonuses in terms of characteristics, it's this number here, the, the 10 number. So the bonus for ballistic skill is four, the bonus for toughness is three, uh, the bonus for fellowship is, is four. And so double this, it's six. So it's six plus one D five. Now that's not a whole load. And there are other ways to improve that as you go on. Uh, so, like, let, let's say double toughness bonus plus 1d5. So let's roll 1d5. Four. Pretty good. Uh, so we actually get, um, we actually get ten total. Uh, which means, you know, uh, for this one, I guess we'll put that in. So we get ten wounds. There we go. Uh, if you go down below ten wounds, you start taking critical damage. You can, uh, you can die even, but you can, you know, lose limbs, lose eyes. You can lose a whole load of stuff, which sucks. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I think, there we go, yes. So how I like to do this 
is I like to give people an option of three times their toughness or like 1d6 or, or like you, you know like you, you just like say say 1d8 right so I could take nine uh, nine nine you know just straight up nine no problem um, or, or even like it, it's it, it's kind of like a thing where where, it, where it's like I understand it sucking rolling like a one you know if you have seven wounds that does really feel like it's gonna be so easy for you to die so it's nice to give the player an opportunity to not have to roll something random like like how survivable you are but at the same time you need you know you need to make it worth your roll while so if you roll uh, if you roll like 1d10 and then you get a 10 you know you're gonna be going in with 16 wounds which is quite a lot um you know like with with armor and things like that you're gonna be fairly survivable even with like nine hit even with like nine wounds and you can obviously also be beef it up as you go so yeah we'll we'll, we'll we'll you know just just keep that kind of stuff in mind like the 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 1d5 is a little bit yeah but uh but o only really because you you, you don't want to be that person with like a tiny amount of hit points and you have to be like super cautious and try never to get shot or hit or anything so I, I don't know um I'd, I'd say the best way to do it is by the book but if you want to offer people like a solid 10 hit points or they can roll like their double their bonus plus 1d6 or 1d8 or something like that that wouldn't be terrible either um because there's always a chance they're going to roll a one and then that is terrible but but they have the choice so they they could be like oh, okay well crap i i failed but i you know i gambled um so the last thing is fate points roll a 1d10 don't mind if i do roll 1d10 shame i didn't roll that uh, eight not too bad uh so on to determine a noble born character starting fate points on a one to three he begins with two on a four to nine he begins with three on a ten he begins with four so I start with four at uh, three. Sorry, that's me cheating. I start with three fate points, and fate points are here. Three and three. There we go. Now fate points are really good. It fate points basically represent the fact that you're a powerful character in this world. Uh, some some really strong NPCs do get fate points, but basically what it means is if you are rolling, let's say I'm rolling my ballistic skill to shoot someone. Uh, I failed, I can say to the GM, I'm going to use a fate point on that, and roll again, and you have to take the second result. So if it's even worse, how did I know it was going to be worse? If it's even worse, you have to keep that. Uh, you can also burn a fate point, uh, which basically means for the rest of the campaign, you lose that fate point, but you can burn it to not die. So say you get shot, and you're bleeding out, you, you just say, like, I burn a fate point, you lose that fate point, you go down to two, uh, you never get that fate point back, and you will you will have to, uh, yeah, the, the gem will have to make it sure that, you, make it so that you survive, but you don't die. Um, and there, there's a few other things, like you can use a fate point to add 10 to a skill roll or, or something like that, but yeah, uh, fate points are useful because sometimes there's something that you feel you should succeed and you, you just don't you like roll really really badly maybe you jam your gun or something like that and you just want to re-roll that so you don't jam your gun like even if you miss you just some sometimes things like that can save the group uh so let's carry on and let's try and go a bit quicker so duty bound and oh no sorry zealot and chosen by destiny destiny are, are the options now, I don't think this character's a zealot. I think Chosen by Dest Destiny suits him a bit more. So, uh, we're kind of going down the far right side of this. Uh, you remember the, the graph? We're going down like the far right side right now. So, uh, choose one of the following results and apply it to your character. Uh, Seeker of Truth, you've gained Foresight Talent and Enemy of the Academics or Ecclesiarchy. Okay. Uh, or Xenophile, you gain a plus ten, a bonus of plus ten to fellowship tests when dealing with alien races or cultures, and minus five to willpower tests involving alien artifacts, alien psychic powers. Uh, fated for greatness, you gain plus one fate point, but you also suffer one d ten plus one insanity points. 
don't worry too much about things like insanity points and malignancy or corruption points. That's basically a way to guarantee that a character uh, doesn't get too powerful. Because basically, uh, as you go through, you will gain insanity points and corruption points. When it gets to a certain point, your character either goes completely insane and they're effectively dead, or they mutate so badly that they're just gone. You know, they're not a person anymore. Um, and in both cases, that's where you kind of retire the character. Personally, I'm not a massive fan of that, because I, I find... I find unless you're playing like a really long, long, long ass campaign, uh, you know, you don't tend to get to that point. Uh, and if you get that really, really quickly, it, fe it feels kind of crappy to just lose your character because you rolled badly. So I, I tend to take it easy with insanity points and corruption points. Um, but it, it, to each their own. Let's. Uh, is this guy particularly lucky? Or do, is he. He's definitely not a seeker of truth. Xenophile could work. Fated for Greatness could work. Um, yeah, Fated for Greatness. I I, I feel like uh, I feel like this guy. So let's roll one d ten plus one. Oh God, roll one d ten. I'll just add plus one myself. Four. So we got four insanity points, which uh, right here four insanity points. And we get an extra fate point, so we are on four. So technically, if I'd have rolled that ten for the fate for the fate point roll, I would be on five fate points, which is basically my character cannot die, and I re-roll everything. Which, as a GM, I must say, I wouldn't look forward to that character. Um, so next one is trials and travails. Like basically, after he after he decided he was chosen by destiny, and he's like, "Maha, yes, I'm fated for greatness." Where did he go next, and uh, what happened while he was out there? So we have a choice of uh, High Vendetta or Dark Voyage. So uh, High Vendetta. Um, so something happened while you were out and you were caught up in a deadly vendetta with another faction. Murderous few, feud that consumed your life and sent friends to their graves. I kind of like that actually for this character. So uh, you cha you gain your choice uh, of the Die Hard or Paranoia talent and gain the Inquiry skill. If you already pr possess it, increase it by one level. Or, uh, wait, do we get both of these? It looks like we get both of these. Uh, you will now allow no serious offence to your, to your honour and person or those under your protection to pass unchallenged. You may take a willpower test to avert this if you wish. Okay, so if, if someone insults you or your crew, uh, you basically, you feel compelled to, uh, like, like escalate it, like, step it up. Okay, so that, that, that that's cool. And that kind of makes sense for this character, the way he's gone so far. Uh, die Hard uh, or Paranoia. Take the Die Hard and the Inquiry skill. So we gain an Inquiry. There we go. Yeah, so we just gain that skill. I think it's trained i guess uh and then in in talents we have the die hard which don't worry about what the talents do obviously you can go and look it up and and, and add in if you're making your own character uh like just make a little note of what it does i find very often players forget about a lot of their skills uh sometimes and then they get bonuses and stuff uh, as the gm i do my best to like remind them of their skills and to remember their skills but ultimately it's down to the player. Um, so, you know, if you're GMing this, don't worry too much about keeping track of everyone's talents and skills because there's going to be so many that it's, it's just not... Uh, it's not it's not worthwhile. Um, players, if you get a talent, make sure you remember you have that talent. So, motivation. Now, we're still down the far right-hand side, so we've got the last two. Uh, which means it's either Pride or Prestige. Now, I'm thinking Prestige. Except for, I because he's like noble-born, very rich, destined for greatness, Pride gives you an heirloom. Now, an heirloom is like a family treasure. So, I'm going to go with Pride, because that's always a lot of fun, and it can help shape the character if they have like some really special armor... 
you know, maybe they're like very protected. If they have like a, a weapon, you know, some kind of like chain ancient chain sword or something that's really like high tech. Like may, maybe they were, um, maybe they won it in a bet, uh, you know, like a game of cards with family or something like that. You know, that, that, can, that can really do this kind of thing. So, um, pride, you want respect, admiration of allies. And I think this, this rogue trader is starting to turn out very like, uh, He's, he's, he's starting to turn out very, um, very vaunted, very, like, yes, my family is amazing, thank you. Uh, so let's see what his heirloom item is. Uh, it's a 1d100. Okay, so let's roll. Roll. Uh, no, sheepy, come on. Oh, I've just done this over here. Don't mind me, there we go, die hard. Okay, uh, roll 1d100. 46, I think that's the second one. Uh, no, it's the third. An ancestral seal, a potent and respected mark of power once held, passed down through a family even after their scions have long departed the vaults of imperial rulership. You gain a plus 10 bonus to all interaction skill tests when displaying the seal and dealing with imperial citizens or organizations. Quite cool. Okay, so like maybe his ancestors were officials of some kind. Maybe they even owned like an entire subsector of the of the thing, and they they've slowly declined, but they they still have that power. They still have that that name to uh, they 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 still have that name to like throw about. Uh, so that is the uh, normally again we'd write this down, but obviously you know, we don't really need to. Uh, you just put it down here, probably in other notes. I think yeah. Um, so the next thing we're going on to is we're going on to the uh, careers. Now, if we go down here, uh, this, 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 all this stuff here is talking about like how to build your character and like names and stuff like that. Obviously, we're not going to do that this time. Um, but and then it's, it's got the experience points. All characters begin play with four thousand five hundred XP. Uh, so we'll just we'll track we'll track that down for later. Uh, XP XP XP. There we go. So total XP spent is five hundred because the character creation uh, you take five hundred for like going down all these steps and everything, and then we've got four thousand five hundred to spend, I believe. Also, uh, one thing of note is do try to add in all of the advancements you take. Uh, when you create your character because that means that later on in the campaign if you're a bit if you're wondering how much xp you have and you haven't been keeping perfect you know like notes of it or something sometimes the session ends uh late and you you just want to go straight to bed you don't write down that you got 300 xp or 350 xp for the session uh then you can work your way backwards through your advancement taken and you'll know exactly how much xp you spent just makes it a whole load easier for everyone uh, okay, so, uh, given character's life, we're not going to come up with a name. It's talking about, the, you know, your nature, why you're a leader aboard a rogue trader, trader vessel, what does the Coronas Expanse call to you. We're going to be playing in a custom, uh, in a custom sector that I'm going to make myself, and I've already started work on. There's a couple of interesting planets already. Uh, I won't say which ones not to go to, but there's some you shouldn't go to already. Uh, what would you sacrifice? This, this kind of thing. Uh, and then... This is one of the important things, uh, which we'll get into probably more in the next video, talking about the ship, but uh, starting profit factor and ship points. Now, the way this works is you have, I believe it's 90, yeah, you have 90 total points, and you can go uh, with lots of profit factor or lots of ship points. Uh, profit factor means you can, means you're very rich, but you don't have an amazing ship. So you'll have like a smaller ship with less good equipment on your ship. Uh, really low profit factor means you don't have a whole load of money, but you have an amazing ship. Personally, I like higher pro I I like sh higher ship points, and I tend to I tend to say to the crew who I'm GMing, uh, they can choose what they'd like. So if they want forty profit factor and fifty ship points. Uh, that will give them enough points to work towards a decent ship while also having some money left. Or they can go full profit factor, not very good ship, or low profit factor, you know, really not very rich, 
but a lot of ship points and like a really good ship and you know th th even this can work towards telling a story of the crew and the and the road trader like if we take the uh if we take the low profit factor and the good ship we could have maybe come across a derelict hulk like a space hulk drifting out there and commandeered it maybe fought like the gene stealers or probably not gene stealers because that would be death but you know you fought was it whatever aliens are making at home and then you take it back for repairs and refit maybe you bring people out to kind of you know go through it and repair it and get it up and running again you know hey if if you do that kind of thing uh that and you know if you're gming or if you're a player that could actually be the opening kind of scenes is you finding this ship and then starting to you know clear it out and get people in to like fit it up with all the nice stuff like see what it's got all that kind of stuff uh so now what we're gonna do uh select equipment yes yes uh, we'll do that later so career paths uh so going very quickly through the career paths you have arch militant warriors without peer leaders of soldiers uh they're basically uh, they're com combatants they're officers i guess uh astropath transcendent communicators of the imperium soulbound psychers they're kind of like mages i guess they have uh, a lot of telepathy abilities as well um very often your astropath transcendent will uh, like bur burrow into someone's mind and like extract information things like that it can go horribly wrong so you know if you want to be an astropath transcend transcendent be ready for things to go horribly wrong uh, Explorator is a machine tech guy. Uh, masters of machinery, seekers of ancient knowledge. Very often they like to find uh, ancient technology and just fiddle with it. And that goes very badly too a lot of the time. Uh, missionary is a priest basically. Not really so much with the healing, but uh, very often they use flamers to burn heretics. Um, navigator is uh, mutant, pilots of the warp. Basically, the way space travel works is you aim where you want to go, then you make a series of rolls that tells you how badly and far off you went from that. That's what navigators do. They mess up the entire game for everyone. There is a game. Uh, I didn't run it, but I was told about it by a friend who ran it. There was a game where they went... I think it was like 50 years into the future. And then... The next jump they did took them a hundred years into the past so they ended up 50 years in the past and they they were talking about hanging around to meet themselves in 50 years they were like they were like these jumps have gone so badly uh we should just chill here and wait for ourselves to turn up and then tell ourselves not to make this jump and to go somewhere else and do something else and then just kill ourselves um <laughs> So yeah, personally, I don't like it getting that ridiculous where, you know, where there's like, it takes them like, you know, it takes them like 200 years to get where they're going. Uh, but a, a little bit of fuckery in the warp is, is fine. Uh, the rogue trader is the captain, basically, of the ship. Um, just, a, just a quick aside. In this game, the rogue trader is the leader. I find the best way to run the game is to have a council of of players so everyone talks about what they want to do and then they decide together the rogue trader is in charge but he should never like steamroll over everyone completely um there will be instances where the rogue trader will decide what to do but it's worthwhile encouraging your players to talk as a team to decide what they want to do and then the rogue trader can rp deciding what to do you know that that kind of thing it's it's a lot of fun and a lot of responsibility to be the rogue trader uh so very very off very often if you're if you're making a uh if you're making a rogue trader game it's worth having those uh it's worth having those players that are a bit more decisive that are a bit more kind of uh, take charge being the rogue trader you shouldn't you should you shouldn't you shouldn't encourage someone who's very quiet and lets everyone else speak all the time 
to be the rogue trader because you'll end up with kind of this uh this very like hesitant story where where the rogue trader's really not sure what to do and some of the others are kind of taking over and it, it can it can get a little bit off just you know tr try and I, I wouldn't say ever don't let people play a role they want to play just make sure they know that they're going to be the ones in charge for the most part uh then you got the seneschal keeper of secret knowledge subtle investigators usually they do the trading they do the uh, criminal stuff uh they have a lot of contacts all this kind of thing they're, they're almost like an assistant but like a badass assistant uh and then you got the void master pilots gunners masters of space very often uh they fly the ship in combat they run the guns uh the macro cannons on the side uh quite often they can be just like fight pilots which is a lot of fun um quite quite often you'll have like a void master uh leading your ships to do like bombing runs on the enemy ship and then you'll have your arch militant leading hit and runs as well so that can be interesting uh there's a lot of fun stuff to do in uh in, in rogue trader with your ship and everything okay so you got ranks let's not worry about that uh skill and talent advances again let's not worry about that right now so rogue trader this is the character we're making and this is the captain of the ship so these are the starting skills uh command commerce charm so we go over to here and we go command where's commerce is commerce not on here charm charm there we go where the hell is commerce uh increase Maybe it's an added one here. Okay, so we'll go commerce, and that is a, uh, I was going to say fellatio. That is a fellowship uh, skill. Uh, charm, common law, imperium. Yeah, okay, so these are some extra ones as well. Uh, so common law, imperium, and evaluate. So, does evaluate on here? No. So we go uh, CL, imperium. So, uh, Imperium? No, Imperium. And that's intelligence. We take a tick in both of these. So, uh, for commerce, uh, maybe you get a whole load of swag from a, from a ship you pirate, and then you want to know where the best place to sell that is for a little bit of profit factor, or for a little bit of, like, trade and goodwill. Uh, you'd say, like, where do I sell this? Uh, Sheepdog, or Games Master, or GM. Uh, and I say, roll me a commerce. You roll the commerce, and then I tell you or don't tell you, depending on how well you did. Uh, same thing for Common Law Imperium. If you want to know, uh, if, if you're like interacting with a regiment of Imperial Guard, maybe, uh, I could have you roll Common Law Imperium. If you're asking about a certain sector or certain area or certain customs, you can roll Common Law Imperium. And it just... It, it lets you know lore and know details of the game that you yourself don't know, but your character should, or possibly would. Uh, okay, so literacy we've got, but now we can actually tick it. Beautiful. Uh, then we have scholastic lore astromancy. So scholastic lore astromancy. There we go beautiful uh we have a speak language high gothic low gothic and we can tick those now beautiful tick tick um talents so i'm not going to add in the talents because they they do these you know they they do things i'm not going to add in like the uh so air of authority basically means that you can uh, give commands to like multiple people and give them a bonus from that uh, as I remember uh, pistol weapon training means you don't you, you don't get like minuses to using pistols or melee weapons uh, and then you've got your starting gear so uh, best craftsmanship las pistol or good craftsmanship hand cannon uh, common craftsmanship plasma pistol you can choose one of those uh, I'd say probably a las pistol or maybe plasma pistol is a good starter weapon. Uh, best craftsmanship mono board, mono sword, common craftsmanship power sword. Seeing as this guy is melee and uh, he's kind of rich, I'd say probably common craftsmanship power sword. 
uh, micro bead void suit set of fine clothing xeno pelt kilt uh, cloak not kilt uh, and then some light carapace armor or stormtrooper carapace armor which will basically you know mitigate damage against you uh, and now after all of that all of that kind of counts for like 500 xp what you do now is you take your advances so uh for the let, let me just go back and double check this so yeah uh the advancement scheme is is these 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 are these are like the xps uh so it's plus five per one i'm just wondering if they i'm wondering if there's like a uh uh, a limit to how early you can get like expert characteristic advance. Uh, progress through each progression levels, starting with simple. The costs for these increase for each career. Uh, the costs are cumulative, so you couldn't pay 500 XP for a 10. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. All right. So the way the way this works. Uh, and I just needed to double check this because it, it's been a little while since I've made a character on this. Uh, let's take our uh, strength, for example. So we can spend 500 to buy a um, to buy a simple strength increase. Uh, and you can't buy that again. The next time you buy a, a strength characteristic advance, it'll have to be intermediate and it'll be for 750. Now each of these increase your skills by two. Uh, by five sorry so we could spend that 500 xp uh and that would take us to 4000 for character creation and we'd go up to uh to 43 2 42 uh we could do that and then we could buy the next one for 750 we'd go down to 3250 on the xp and we'd go up to uh seven so uh, so 47 and we'd have 47 strength which is really good but it gets more and more expensive as you go so it's it, it's kind of it's kind of iffy and like th this is again like do it doing your uh doing your wounds roll um i think you know one of the things we'd want to buy would be the uh would be the uh toughness increase so 500 if we increase that to 41, so we, do, I'll, I'll show you how to do the advancement taken. So you do uh, 500 XP, uh, and we'll just put this on zero, 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 and it's uh, toughness simple. So you take toughness simple, um, you see here, toughness simple is 500, and you can, you, you mark it off for 500 XP, you put a thousand spent, that's ten thousand sheepy. Uh, and now your uh, toughness bonus is eight, which means that the four I rolled earlier will take us to twelve wounds instead of. Yeah. So you, you want to wait till character creation is done to actually roll your, actually roll your wounds because you might want to increase your toughness and this kind of thing. Uh, so. For example, uh, the fellowship is a hundred, and then two fifty, and then five hundred, and seven fifty. So you could spend a lot of your a lot of your uh, character creation stuff, uh, getting your characteristic advance going up. And you might ask, like, you know, why wouldn't I? Because that gives me better rolls. The thing is, is you can take things like command for a hundred XP, and that's a skill. So if I take command for a hundred XP. I can't take on one for 100 XP because it's already on there. I'll do a different one, sorry. Uh, so if you take dodge for 100 XP, there we go. Uh, this now means that uh, when you roll, when you, because the thing is, is when you have to dodge a, like if someone tries to shoot you, you can dodge that. And that means they don't hit you at all, completely negating the damage, even if they hit you. But if you don't have dodge ticked, uh, you you have to roll a, a 16 so I rolled a holy crap I rolled a 16 um, so I succeeded that dodge but the point is is that it's very difficult to do um, if I spend 100 XP it's now 33 
and I fail it horribly. But that's not the point either. I'm, I'm not making my point here. My point is that uh, to increase my do to increase my dodge ability, it cost me 100 XP. Uh, if I was to do it here, agility, 250. And it only increases by 5, whereas the skill increases. If we go down, down like this way, you can see you've got like barter plus 20, right? So to get to get barter plus 20 uh, without spending on the skill, we'd have to spend 350, 850, 900... 1600 so a 1600 xp would have to be spent on fellowship to get plus 20 when using just the characteristic advances uh on, on here i can't remember what i said it was was it commerce we, we use commerce on here it costs 200 to 400 so like two skill advances in commerce which would be uh, commerce isn't on here yeah, which would be that. So that puts us at 66. Five degrees of success, roll to 16. Of course I did. Uh, yeah, so ba basically, like, I, ho I hope you're seeing what I'm saying here, is basically the characteristic advances are great, but they don't take you up that much further. So, and they're very expensive. So they, the characteristic advances help everything. So any strength skill you're going to use is going to help all of them. But taking like a simple, taking a simple advance on like climb is, 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 you know, if you're doing a lot of climbing, can actually be a lot more worth it. If you're getting shot at a lot, increasing your dodge is going to be a lot cheaper than increasing your agility kind of thing. Uh, so, yeah, let's, uh, let's see here. So, uh, rank one is for, I think it's from 4999 to 9999 so you know as you as you um as you gain xp you'll gain access to a lot more advances uh you can see down here but here we've got like awareness command commerce charm ciphers rogue trader that will let you um send messages to other rogue traders in cipher so that other people can't you know can't like uh, translate it or, or get your messages you know they'll be sending code uh, common law of rogue traders dodge evaluate pilot spacecraft uh secret tongue rogue trader secret uh, speak language traders can't you've got things like air of authority ambidextrous ambidextrous lets you use two weapons at the same time with less of a penalty uh some weapon trainings renowned warrant that kind of thing and, and then later on, you've got, like, the plus 20 skills when you get to, like, rank 8, Rogue Trader, uh, Assassin's Strike, Deadeye Shot, Dual Shot. Uh, there's there's extra advances as well. There's, like, specialized uh, things in other books uh, where you can, like, you can take a rank of um, the, uh, the Acquisitionist, which is, like, a Treasure Hunter Rogue Trader, and he gets a lot of skills based around, like, being Indiana Jones, basically. Um... So yeah, that's uh, uh, you can you can see here you've got the different the different careers. Uh, they're they're all really fun and they're all different enough that you're not gonna like step on each other's toes too much. Like the you can see here the rogue traders fellowship ad uh, advances were a hundred starting off uh, for the explorator who's like a kind of tech priest. Uh, he works with all the machines and stuff. You got like 500 for the first advance so obviously it's gonna if you can build a character that doesn't suit that, that doesn't go with like the norms uh but very often you know you're going to build character very similar to everyone else building a explorator or rogue trader character you, you know you're just gonna have your own specific like vents on it and like there's specializations and stuff you can make and you could see me see here they get completely different starting skills talents and gear so, like, they, they get, for example, a Hell Gun, which is, uh, I believe, a Hotshot Lads Gun. Uh, does a lot of penetration. Good for getting through armor. Uh, the Explorators, in incidentally, are um, one of the, f uh, like, starting off, they're probably the best at dealing with, like, demons. Uh, they get a Power Axe as well. 
and they get a servo skull and a whole load of other stuff. Um, so yeah, th this was this was the character creation, and uh, you can see here like we we can we can go further. I feel like you've got the idea, but you know I can, for example, I want if I if I want uh, if I want to be able to talk to rogue traders in secret, like set up dealings, you know, meet at like a bar um, on some planet and and like work out a secret deal. I can take the skill uh, advance secret tongue rogue trader a hundred now not all of these skills you'll be asked to you'll be asked to roll like if you have secret tongue rogue trader rogue trader i'm not going to ask you to roll that you know like that's something you've bought that's something you have knowledge of and it can be assumed you have like decent knowledge of it unless it's unless it's something like very specific that you're asking that you may not know i'll probably just let it go and you know you'll be like i'd like to speak to this guy in the uh, secret tongue rogue trader um, and then you can just have a conversation with the NPC or like another player or whoever and you'll just have a conversation and no one can understand it like that kind of thing uh, may maybe I'd, I'd get you to roll secret tongue rogue trader if there was someone listening who maybe knew the tongue or, or who, who had an understanding of the of the language but yeah um, so I think how long have we been going on this just over an hour jeez that's quite a long time hopefully you enjoyed this hopefully you understand like everything i tried to be as explanatory as possible without going too far into the entirety of the game i just want to give you an idea of like the very very basics of the game how i like to build characters how i how i like to kind of gm character creation and uh like my my uh my basic like this is how I feel you should do it, while at the time, same time, like, showing you how it's done in the rulebook as well. Uh, so, yeah, I will do another video, guys, where I go through the construction of ships, um, because very often building your ship is the most fun part, because it, it's just so much. You'll, you'll see. You'll see in the video. So, probably, probably when this, probably tomorrow, from when this video comes out, uh, the next video will be the shipbuilding, most likely, maybe a day or two, uh, dependent on my schedule. But um, but yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to building a ship for you guys. So thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget, if you made it this far, you're probably interested. Uh, Twitch.tv forward slash metamancer. Link will be in the in the description. Go follow her now, and then you'll be ready to watch uh, Rogue Trader. We don't have a name for it yet. We're uh, we've got our cast. And it's a pretty good cast. It's uh, quite quite a few of people from the Dark Heresy, except for this time they're in Rogue Trader. Um, the the Dark Heresy Pyrebrand game was hilarious, but they were held back a bit from being completely ridiculous by being Inquisition and all the Heresy stuff in Rogue Trader. That's not a problem. Go as go as weird as you want in Rogue Trader. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So thanks for watching, guys. Uh, don't forget Metamancer. Well, Rogue Trader series will, uh, campaign will be coming out uh, mid-January, probably. Uh, and yeah, I'll see you soon.